Okay, well, welcome back to the second installment of A Call for Discernment. Uh, this session is entitled Mangled Manifestations. In this session, we'll look at some of the more dramatic, spectacular things of the faith movement, the things that you can see and touch. Uh, I will say that some of what you see this afternoon will be comical. Some of what you see will be disturbing. So just a little heads up there. Let us begin with the abuse of the gift of tongues. Now, tongues is probably the most debated spiritual gift today, and there is a debate within Christianity today as to whether or not the gift of tongues is still in effect. Some who hold a view known as cessationism believe that tongues and prophecy and some of the other more dramatic sign gifts have ceased with the dying of the apostles and the closing of the canon of scripture. Other Christians believe that all of the spiritual gifts are still in effect today. And that debate is beyond the purposes, uh, the scope of our, our uh, visit here today. It's just far too complicated and involved to get into. But uh, regardless of your view, regardless of your view, what we all should be able to agree upon as Christians is that if the gift of tongues is exercised, it must be exercised within biblical parameters. Regardless of your view, it must be exercised within biblical parameters. Parameters, And that's true, of course, not only the gift of tongues, that's true of all of the spiritual gifts. So there are just a few items that I want us to look at in uh, dealing with the gift of tongues, just kind of in a general nature. Number one, tongues are not unique to Christianity. Some pagan religions speak in tongues as well. Uh, some Hindus speak in tongues, even a few Muslims, if you can believe that, speak in tongues. So just because someone is speaking in tongues does not necessarily mean he or she is getting that ability from God. Tongues can be practiced in an ignorant, ungodly manner. This is very clear from Scripture. Uh, tongues can be practiced in such a way that it brings attention to the individual rather than glorifying Christ and edifying the church. If done in public, in corporate worship, an interpreter must always be present. This, too, is very clear from Scripture. The Apostle Paul says, if there is no one there to interpret, then let him remain silent. And when you look at that in the Greek, that's actually very strong language. If Paul were saying that today, he would, in effect, be telling this person to shut up because he's just bringing, bringing attention to himself, not to Jesus. It is false that all believers should speak in tongues. Some denominations teach that if you are saved, your salvation will be evidenced by you speaking in tongues. And if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. This is patently unbiblical. The Apostle Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions. He says, all are not workers of miracles, are they? All are not teachers, are they? Uh, all do not speak in tongues, do they? And clearly, the implied answer to these rhetorical questions is no. No, they don't. So it's patently unbiblical to teach that if you are saved, your salvation will be evidenced by you speaking in tongues. To teach that can lead a person to do one of two things. It can lead a person to uh, fake the gift, which can be quite easily done, or it can lead a person to unnecessarily doubt his or her salvation. And finally, tongues is the least important of all the spiritual gifts. The Apostle Paul did not put a great deal of emphasis on the gift of tongues possibly because he knew that it could be so easily faked. And the fact of the matter is, you can teach a canary how to speak in tongues. It's not really all that hard. It can be a learned behavior. I have a dear friend in California who uh, used to be in this movement, and in this movement, while in this movement, she spoke in tongues. Uh, now the Lord has brought her out, and she no longer speaks in tongues, but she can still do it. You know, I can, she can just do it at will, just like you turn on and off a light switch and say, Karen, say something in tongues, and she just rattle it off. It's nothing spiritual. It's just a, a technique that she's uh, learned how to, to uh, utilize. So just because someone's speaking in tongues doesn't necessarily mean he or she is getting that ability from God. And uh, I have actually seen literature from a church that teaches people how to speak in tongues. Now, my question is, if this is something for which the Holy Spirit gives us utterance, why is it necessary to teach someone how to do it? And so, with that question in mind, I would submit to you the following clips. Charismatic renewal, um, a renewed understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit amongst Christians of 
all denominations. We need to release him. We have to let him out. Just begin to offer him sounds. Just offer him sounds, like a little child learning to talk. And don't pay any attention to how you feel or how you sound. the experience where you say you're saved then there's the fire baptism when you get the Holy Ghost and that's the tongues thing and they love to work people over you've got to like shoot in on this when you see people gathering around people and start laying hands on and praying with someone you've got to like come in with the camera too it's very important because they'll be laying hands on someone and the poor person will be saying you know thank you Jesus now this is a person that's already saved but they're getting the baptism and someone will be standing there and be going you know and the poor person will be standing there and they're not saying anything then after a while about four or five more will gather around and they'll start doing the same thing you know come on speak it out speak it out until all of a sudden the person will you know get so over well, by the thing that they start going, you know, and the next thing, you know, ah, that's it, you've got it, like they feel good, we've got another one, you know. Then they'll go on to the next person. Said, are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Thank you, Jesus, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus is so good to me tonight, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, I praise the Lord. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, I feel good in my soul. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh. That was a man named Marjo. Uh, Marjo's parents named him after Mary and Joseph, a contraction of Mary and Joseph, Marjo. And his parents were evangelists, and they taught him how to preach. At the tender age of four, Marjo began preaching. And in his early adult life, Marjo had his own evangelism ministry, and he traveled across the country preaching meetings and and healing folks supposedly and uh, boy he could speak in tongues and he could slay people in the spirit and do the whole nine yards but uh, Marjo grew tired of it and uh, several years later he directed a full-length motion picture on documentary on himself and in this documentary he made a big announcement and he said oh by the way I'm a fake everything he did was fake Marjo wasn't even a believer uh, an agnostic at best but yet you see how he could go around and he could preach and he could speak in tongues and he could do the whole nine yards. He could turn the gift of tongues on and off just like you do a light switch. And so proof positive that just because someone is speaking in tongues doesn't necessarily mean that he is getting that ability from God. I want us to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You're of course welcome to consult your copy of God's Word, but I'm going to put this up on the screen too but before I do let me give you a little bit of background information to the book of first Corinthians the Apostle Paul was out on his second missionary journey and he came to the city of Corinth and there in Corinth the Apostle Paul preached the gospel a number of people were saved and Paul spent about 18 months with them discipling them and growing them up in their relationship with Christ and when he felt like they had reached a level of spiritual maturity sufficient enough to carry things on in his absence, Paul left them and went to other destinations to preach the gospel. Well, Paul may have left a little bit too soon because some time passed and he got a letter from a lady named Chloe back in Corinth. And in this letter, Chloe informed the Apostle Paul that things had gone awry in the church in Corinth. That there was a group of people within this church who had become very arrogant in their exercise of the spiritual gifts. And it had almost become a contest between them as to who could prove themselves to be the most spiritual. You know, well, I'm more spiritual than you are because I speak in tongues more than you do. I have the gift of healing more strongly than you do. Look at me. Look how spiritual I am. They even gave themselves a name. They called themselves the pneumaticoi, which in the Greek means the spirituals. And because of this spiritual arrogance, all kinds of sin and immorality crept into the church and it just about destroyed the church from the inside out. And when the Apostle Paul heard of this, he was very vexed of heart, and he sat down and he wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, and that letter is what we have today as the book of 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to read this passage in the way in which the Apostle Paul would have wanted it read and understood by use of my voice inflection. Chapter 4, verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us ye might learn not to exceed what is written, 
in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. It's a very important precept here. The Apostle Paul writes to these Corinthians and he says, do not exceed what is written. Dear friends, as Christians we are not to exceed what is written us in God's Word. We are not to add anything to the Bible, nor are we to take anything away from it. We are to stay safely within biblical parameters. In matters of belief, in matters of our theology, and in matters of what we practice, we are to stay safely within biblical parameters. Because when we exceed what is written, when we exceed biblical parameters, what we are doing is we are opening ourselves up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. Paul continues, For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Paul is saying, why are you boasting about something that was given to you? You see, spiritual gifts are just that. They are gifts given to us when we're saved. They're not anything that we earn, not anything towards which we work. They're given to us. And Paul is saying, why are you boasting about something that was given to you? You see, the exercise of spiritual gifts should say nothing about the person displaying them. It should say everything about the one who gives them. Paul continues, You are already filled. You have already become rich. You've become kings without us. And I would indeed that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. Very sarcastic. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you, no, you're prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you, you're strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed, roughly treated, and are homeless. Doesn't sound much like prosperity to me. And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are vowed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. And in verse 14, it's like the Apostle Paul pauses, catches his breath, maybe he blushes a little bit, and he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. To give you a very technical, theological term to what the Apostle Paul is doing here in this passage, uh, I learned this at seminary. I hope it impresses you. Paul's taking these folks out to the woodshed. <laughs> Paul's taking these folks out to the woodshed, and he is whooping them. He's slam dunking them. Paul is writing to correct some of the very same kind of behavior that we see day in and day out on Christian television and what's going on in many of these churches. Same kind of behavior that was going on in the church in Corinth is going on today. And that's what Paul was addressing. And sometimes as I watch Christian television and I go to these meetings, I just find myself asking the question in my mind to these individuals, have you even read the book of 1 Corinthians? Do you have the foggiest idea what this book is about? Because much of 1 Corinthians was written to correct some of the very same kind of behavior that's going on today. And um, just as a little aside, I'm a Baptist, and, and as I travel around this great land of ours, sometimes I'll see a Corinth Baptist Church. That would be the last name I would want to name my church. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's free. That won't cost you. Uh, consider this video clip of Kenneth Copeland and Rodney Howard Brown. Rodney Howard Brown is the man who calls himself the Holy Ghost bartender. No worried what other people think. No, uh huh. Doesn't matter what they think. Ha 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 ha. Oh, esta pacalia do. Oh, le bebe di abbasso dopre. In a man ma non bongo lombon chamber. Me ne mombo rivia casti a cello soso. Hey, 
Elma ve keçiyi ne penişte, tam frama, begrede. Ah, sütur ne me imbran ben cıngolu çiyip et. E enema sütur ediyiz tekeye. E ne me 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 fiyesto po. E enema mamoru biyeste. E enema cıngur etele biya. An sakara diyesto kora. E boya, e ha. Uuu, me fiye pala, meni in sütur ediyiz. If I were to give you an assignment, and your assignment was to go home for me tonight and write out a skit to demonstrate how not to speak in tongues, that would be it. Every biblical parameter there is on the gift of tongues, they just broke. And what does that kind of behavior do to glorify Christ or to edify the saints? Nothing. Who does that bring attention to? themselves. Same kind of thing that's going on in the church of Corinth, going on today. And uh, this little bit on the lighter side, a little blast from the past, Robert Tilton. Isn't that something called a moshoko doma zata? Lata toto moton doiti ki shakala kapoko toko toka laka moshiti. Kali shikado boko tola baka tai shakabo choko laka moko teya. I love you. Robert Tilton's so spiritual he can even speak in baby talk tongues. <laughs> now let's look at spectacular claims. All of the faith preachers have these wild spectacular claims about how God is just doing amazing things through their ministries. This is one of the ways they get you to continue following their ministries and get you to continue opening up your wallets to their ministries. This from Benny Hinn. Yeah, I was in Ghana just recently. We had half a million people show up and a man was ra raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact, people. Do you literally believe that someone has been resurrected on the program? Oh, John, I would not limit God. Uh, God can raise the dead, absolutely. I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. They brought a man, and this man was put uh, uh, on the platform, and he was dead. The man was dead. I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. And a man was ra raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact, people. I have not seen it. But here's first what I see for, for TBN. You're going to have people raised from the dead watching this network. You're going to have people raised from the dead watching TBN. I'm telling you, I see this in the spirit. It's going to be so awesome. Jesus, I give you praise for this. That people around the world, maybe not so much in America, people around the world who will lose loved ones will say to undertakers, uh, not yet. I want to take my dead loved one and place them in front of that TV set for 24 hours. Benny, yeah. I'm telling you, Jesus. people will be, people, I'm telling you, I feel the anointing talking here. Oh, yeah. Jesus. People yeah. are going to be canceling funeral services. Merciful God. And bringing their dead in their caskets. Placing them, my God, I feel that on here. Any Placing them before a television set, waiting for God's part to come through and touch them. Merciful. I see rows of um, ca of caskets lining up in front of this TV set, and I see him bringing them closer to the TV set. Mm -hmm. And as people are coming closer, I see uh, l actually loved ones picking up the hands of the dead and letting them touch the screen and people are, are getting raised. TBN will no longer be just a television network. It will be an extension of heaven to earth. My Jesus, mercy. Oh. I'm, I'm, the Lord, the Lord just said to me, the Lord just said to me, 
these words I'm hearing myself saying for the first time. TBN will not be only a Christian network. It will be an extension of heaven to the earth. An extension. It will be like a, like a tube from heaven that the earth can look and say, I'm looking at heaven. I'm partaking of, of heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm getting connected to heaven through this TV tube. If I can say it, it will be heaven's signal to the earth. It would be as though heaven is transmitting and earth is receiving through that set. So if you want to go to heaven, you want to see heaven, you want to taste heaven, turn on that channel, because mm. you will. Mm. Mm. Now, as ridiculous as that obviously is, there is something more sinister at work here. Benny Hinn says that TBN will be like an extension from heaven to the earth, like a tube from heaven to the earth. What the faith preachers would never admit in so many words, dear friends, yet unmistakably, the consequence of what, much of what they teach is this, is that the consequence of what they teach has an undeniable tendency to divorce God's people from their reliance upon His Word. Think about what he said. TBN will be like an extension from heaven to the earth. He says, so if you want to know what heaven's like, if you want to taste heaven, turn on TBN. So, in other words, don't don't labor in the, in the book under the direction and leadership of the Holy Spirit. No, that's too hard. Just turn on TBN because it's like a tube from heaven to the earth. The faith preachers would never admit it. But the extension of what they teach, undeniably, leads people to a place where they are becoming more and more divorced from their reliance upon the Word of God. This too from Benny Hinn. I believe that Jesus, God's Son, is about to appear physically in meetings and to believers around the world to wake us up. He appeared after His resurrection and He's about to appear before His second coming. The Lord has done this in the past, but He's about to do it again. Now hear this. I'm prophesying this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is about to appear physically in some churches and some meetings and to many of His people for one reason, to tell you He's about to show up. Might the Bible have anything to say about this prophecy? Indeed, Jesus' own words, Then if any man shall say unto you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there He is, do not believe him, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. Jesus told us these individuals would show up. Here they are. Many of you may have heard about one Todd Bentley recently, who has made uh, huge waves in the... Uh, hyper-charismatic, signs and wonders, word of faith world. Uh, Todd Bentley has had a number of spectacular claims himself. In fact, I've been studying these individuals for a long time. Todd Bentley, uh, by far, is the most bizarre and, I think, heretical of them all. But among the claims that Todd Bentley made, one of them, he claimed that a 14-foot-tall angel named Emma is the one that came and began this healing revival that broke out in Lakeland, Florida earlier in 2008, spring of 08. And uh, interestingly, this 14-foot-tall angel named Emma supposedly is the same angel that appeared to William Branham, who was a false prophet who claimed that the Trinity was a demonic doctrine. The very first time Todd Bentley mentioned this, that this angel was from William Branham, that should have been a huge red flag to everyone around him. Whoa, wait a minute. Let's put on the brakes here and look at this thing. But nobody seemed to want to do that. Also, Bentley claimed that thousands of documented healings and over 30 people were raised from the dead in this revival in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, he actually challenged the news media to come down and check his story out. I was there in uh, May of this year of 08, and he was on stage, and he said, come on CNN, come on Fox News, come on MSNBC. You come down here and you check these stories out. We have the documented proof. 
And so Nightline came down, and then they, they interviewed Todd Bentley, and uh, they asked him, they said, do you have any documented proof? He said, oh, yes. He, they said, well, we would like to have three examples. And Bentley said, oh, we can give you thousands. And they said, no, just give us three. And so finally, Todd Bentley's ministry forwarded three examples of supposed healings. And when you start tracing these things out, following them, doctors' names were blotted out, patients' names blotted out, phone numbers missing, none of the stories uh, were documented, none of them. And presumably these three were probably the best Todd Bentley could, could afford. None of them panned out. And by the way, of these 30 people who were supposedly raised from the dead, no one has yet to come up on stage and say, I'm one of those 30, I was dead, now I'm alive. Also, Todd Bentley claimed that he went to heaven. He was sucked up into heaven through a column of fire, found himself on an operating table in heaven where he was strapped down by four angels, two on each side, and they proceeded to cut him open with a miter saw in heaven and then started stuffing him full of white boxes which were full of giftings, wisdom, discernment. He didn't get much of that. And uh, it just so bizarre. Friends, you cannot make this stuff up. It is that bizarre. Todd Bentley also claimed to regularly hear from God. God told him to do a number of these, number of things. And among some of the things that God told him to do, one of them, God told Todd Bentley to leg drop the pastor of the particular church he was in. This is a wrestling move that you see in professional wrestling. And so Todd Bentley said he ran over to the pastor and he leg dropped the pastor. Friends, if your worship service has gotten to the point where you can no longer distinguish a worship service from professional wrestling, something's wrong. God also supposedly told Todd Bentley to go up to a crippled woman and bang her legs up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. All of this is on YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for it. It's there. And probably most famously or infamously, as the case may be, God supposedly told Todd Bentley to go up to an elderly woman and kick her in the face with his biker boot, and then she would be healed. And Todd Bentley said that he went up to this woman and kicked her in the face with his biker boot. He said the woman fell over power of God hit her and the woman fell over and I was thinking, well man, I bet she did fall over. You kicked her in the face. I said, God, I've prayed for like a hundred crippled people, not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. I walked up and I grabbed her legs and I started going, be healed, be healed. I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face. With your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. And there's actually another clip of Todd Bentley on YouTube where a, a man came up with stage 4 colon cancer up on stage. He had stage 4 colon cancer. Todd Bentley told him to raise his arms. The guy raised his arms, stretched him up towards the ceiling. Todd Bentley stepped back, bowed his head just for a second, ran up to the guy and kneed him in the stomach. And the guy bent over and crumpled to the floor. This is done all in the name of God. And all of these supposed prophets around Todd Bentley, like Peter Wagner, Paul Cain, Rick Joyner, Stacy Campbell, they all prophesied over him, said that a great revival was coming through Todd. An astonishing, astonishing lack of discernment. Dear friends, if you can't call into question somebody who says that God told him to kick an elderly woman in the face, if you can't call that into question, just what will you question? Now let's look at heavenly encounters. 
it almost seems like if you're going to make it as a big time television preacher today, you had to have been to heaven at least once. And without a doubt, the most entertaining of all of the television preachers is Jesse Duplantis. And even though I know him to be, be a false teacher, when I watch him preach, I'll find myself chuckling sometimes. He's a very funny guy. He's very comical, very entertaining. What put Jesse on the map was this sermon he began preaching back in the mid-90s entitled Close Encounters of the God Kind. And in this message, Jesse Duplantis relates this fanciful tale about how he was called up to heaven one day. And the story began, he said that he was um, having lunch with some other preachers there in the area. They were holding a meeting there. And uh, they were waiting on their food, and all of a sudden Jesse just felt burdened of the Lord to go back to his hotel room and pray. And finally, the, the food came down. It was placed in front of him. He couldn't bear it anymore. He said, man, I'm sorry. I've got to go. I've got to go. And so he got up, left left them, left the food on the table, got back to his hotel, walked into his room, closed the door behind him, and he got down on his knees and he said, Lord, what? And then right at that moment, Jesse says he was sucked out of his room and found himself on a cable car, no less, traveling through the cosmos at a phenomenal rate of speed. There was an angel on the cable car traveling along with him. And when the cable car finally came to a stop, the doors open and Jesse steps out into heaven. And then Jesse goes on to tell you about everything that he saw, everything that he heard while he was in heaven. Now, our first concrete clue that something isn't quite right with Jesse's trip to heaven is what the angel on the cable car told him. The angel said to Jesse, you have an appointment with the great God Jehovah. This is our first concrete clue that something isn't quite right here. Now, I don't want to get too terribly technical with you, but Jehovah is not God's name. God's name is not Jehovah. His name is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. Now, ancient Hebrew had no vowels, uh, had no spaces between the words, had no punctuation, was, and was read from right to left. It's a bear to try to read ancient Hebrew. For, but for our purposes here, Y-H-W-H. -H. Now, what happened about the year 1520 is that a German scholar by the name of Peter Galatinus took the consonants of Yahweh, and then he took another name for God, the name Adonai, which means ruler. These vowels were added later. But in essence, what Galatinus did is he took Yahweh and the vowels of Adonai, and he smushed them together. And when he smushed them together, this is what happened. Because of the Germanic influence, a Y is like our J. The A in Adonai is a short A and sometimes is expressed, written as an E. The H in Yahweh drops down, as does the O in Adonai. The W is like our V. And the final A in Adonai drops down, as does the final H. And voila, you have the name Jehovah. So Jehovah is not God's name. Now, is it a sin to call God Jehovah? No, I don't think it's a sin. I'm not even sure he really takes offense at it, but it's kind of like my name. My name's Justin, but a lot of people don't know me real well will call me Jason. I get called Jason a lot. And uh, do I take offense at that? No, I don't take offense at it, but if I had my druthers, I'd rather you call me Justin because that's my name. Maybe if God had his druthers, he would rather us call him by his real name, that is Yahweh. The point of the matter, however, is this, is that an angel would have known better. An angel would have known better. An angel would never have said you have an appointment with Jehovah. If anything, you would have said you have an appointment with Yahweh. So an angel would have known better, but apparently Jesse Duplantis did not. Watch this video clip from the same message. Listen very carefully to the terminology here that Jesse Duplantis uses. Just might sound familiar. I took my do not disturb, then a little thing, I put it on there and closed the door. There's one minute to one. I looked at the clock, you know, those digital clocks that hotels have. And I knelt down. I, I didn't know what, though. I had no idea what. I said, in this position, like this, I don't know if you can see me or not, just. And I said, Lord, what? And I was sucked out of my room. I heard this. And I went. I just, uh, now I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I believe I was in my body. 
And I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I believe I was in my body. Does that sound familiar? Does that ring a bell with anyone here? Well, if it does, there's good reason for that because it's the exact same terminology that the Apostle Paul used in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at this, verses 2 through 4. The Apostle Paul writes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Notice the exact same terminology that the Apostle Paul used, Jesse Duplantis uses. And so what's Jesse doing? Jesse is trying to elevate his experience to the same authoritative level as that of Scripture. Do you know of whom the Apostle Paul was speaking in this passage? Who was Paul talking about? Himself. That's right, he was talking about himself. Well, you may be wondering, well, if he's talking about himself, why does he use the third person, not the first person? Well, the reason Paul does this is because that is how humbled he was by what he had experienced. Paul had this rapturous experience into paradise, third heaven, and he was so humbled by that, by that that he would not even refer to himself in the first person. He used the third person. And even with that level of humility, God still gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to humble him even further. And notice, too, what do we know about what the Apostle Paul saw and heard while he was in heaven? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We have no idea what he saw, no idea what he heard, because he heard words that are inexpressible that man's not permitted to speak. Contrast that level of humility with Jesse Duplantis. And Jesse Duplantis just can't wait to tell you about everything that he saw, everything that he heard while he was in heaven. I don't know where Jesse went, but it was not to heaven. And Jesse has made a mint off of selling you his books and selling you his videos. To give you an idea of how this movement is making inroads, into our more conservative evangelical churches. Uh, a few years ago, this video was shown to the uh, youth group at the largest Baptist church in my hometown of Vicksburg, Mississippi. They showed this to their youth group. Not as something for them to laugh at, by the way, but something from them to, uh, for them to supposedly learn from. An astonishing lack of discernment. Consider this video clip from the same uh, sermon and listen very carefully to what Jesus supposedly told Jesse while he was in heaven. He said, I chose you. I said, he said, no one else wanted you. But I need you, boy. I need you, Jesse. Jesus told Jesse, I need you. This from Benny Hinn. I will never forget standing in a meeting, worshiping the Lord, and I felt a hand touch my arm. And I looked, and I said, who touched me? And there were some other young people with me in this service, church service. And said, nobody touched you. And I went back to worshiping God, and few seconds, there was the hand again. And I turned and said, somebody touched me. And they kind of looked at me. It happened again, and the third time when I opened my eyes, they were all worshiping God with tears. Oh, to me down their face, but I could still feel the hand. And I heard him speak to me and say, listen to this, the Lord said to me, I need you. Imagine God saying to you, I need you. Imagine indeed, dear friends, I'll say this as gently yet as clearly as I know how to say it. God loves us, but make no mistake about it. God does not need us. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the wonderful counselor, almighty God, Prince of Peace. He has need of no one and no thing. God loves us, but he does not need us. We need him. And any man that's preaching a gospel that says that God needs us is preaching a different gospel. A different gospel.
some of the behavior in the faith movement can only be characterized as bizarre. And these clips will pretty much speak for themselves. We got back off of the platform, and after Benny had prayed for another half an hour or more for the staff and the other pastors that came backstage, we sat down to get a little bite to eat, and I'm, okay, now are you listening? Gold dust was all over Benny's face. And, and I, I actually got down close and tried to get some of it, and, and then I took a picture. The, the picture didn't turn out too well. It wasn't in good focus, but it was just sparkling all over his face. And where that gold dust came from had to be from another dimension. Well, you know what? Keep on worshiping, but I just want you to look as Sister Savannah has this gold that comes so that you can see it as well. It looks like it's silver and gold mixed tonight. The word, word. She said to me a moment ago, there are about 300 angels in this place tonight. Keep worshiping Jesus. Brother Sid Roth. I told you God would visit us here tonight. I told you. Can you tell us what's happening to you? Can you talk to me? Can you, how can they? Oh. Within his ministry. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you say, I don't know, this is really far out tonight. Isn't that wonderful? You need to get far out. You know, just be that intercessor that God wants for the hurting, for the church, you know. And, and being hurt myself, it's like I couldn't do that to the full capacity. But last night when, when Chastity um, sang, you know, come running to the mercy. I want to offer a bit of a disclaimer before I show you the next video clip, and I want to say in intellectual honesty that not all of the faith preachers would endorse what you're about to see. Some would, but some wouldn't. Uh, but what you're about to see will show you the lengths to which this bizarre behavior can go. When we exceed what is written, when we remove ourselves from biblical parameters, what you're about to see will show you where it ends up. And wait till they come to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto. Leave us to ourselves. Don't leave us to yes. our foolish thinking. Lord, we want all that you have. All, yes. all that you have. Yes. And Lord, if it blows our little minds, let them be blown. <laughs> Father, we want all of what you have. All of what you have. We thank you. Hallelujah. Lord just reminded me of the 
Oh, him where he leads, I will follow. And he had a, God told me to look at him, and I looked at him, and he had a tie on, and on, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he'll know, on the tie had a wolf howling at the moon. And the Lord said to me, will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. He said, if I ask you, will you do it? He said, if I can't ask you to do something in your own house, how are you going to do it out there? So, You know, friends, I'm not sure exactly how long it takes to get to the point where you believe being led around on a leash is appropriate behavior for the house of God. I don't know just how long it takes to get there, but I can tell you where it starts. When you exceed what is written, when you exceed biblical parameters, when you do that, dear friends, you remove yourself from God's protection, open yourself up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. That's where it starts. I want us to look now at a video clip uh, dealing with a phenomenon known as Holy Ghost Laughter. This was recorded at Rodney Howard Brown's church in Florida. Snickers, chuckles, side splitting, fall on the floor, belly laughs. All are welcome at this church. CNN's Tom Foreman checked out What's So Funny for AC360. On a warm night in Tampa, young people are out looking for laughs, but hundreds are bypassing comedy clubs to get their chuckles at church <laughs> and guffaws, <laughs> roars, <laughs> screams, <laughs> all standard fare at the Laughing Church. <laughs> Where Dr. Rodney Howard Brown says the Holy Spirit is making folks howl. They're laughing, they're crying, they're shaking, they're falling out of the seats. I knew it had nothing to do with it. You, he arose, he ascended on high. This is worship for Reverend Howard Brown and his thousands of followers. He is coming back, he is coming back, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Unlike other Pentecostal Christians who speak in tongues, these people say the joy of salvation makes them laugh uncontrollably. It's the Holy Spirit. Global outreach program based in America and staffed by 70 people, all enthralled with holy laughter. Well, the question that needs to be asked in evaluating this phenomenon is, is it a biblical practice? Is there any scriptural support for it? And dear friends, I want to tell you, in all my years of reading and studying God's Word, I haven't found anything in the Bible to support Holy Ghost laughter. In fact, when I look through the Bible and I find examples of people who find themselves in the presence of God, what I tend to see are people who are made all too well aware of the great gulf that exists between God's holiness and their sin. What did Isaiah say? He said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I find people who are made all too well aware of the great gulf between God's holiness and their sin. I don't see anybody in Scripture getting their chuckles off of the King of glory. Now I want us to look at a practice known as being slain in the spirit. Probably all of you have seen this either on television, possibly even in person. Just a few brief clips to illustrate this practice. This is your brace. A touch from the hand of Pastor Benny Hinn and believers are overcome by the presence of the Lord. So strong is the feeling, they fall even if he just blows into the microphone. It's known as slaying in the spirit. Yin prefers to call it falling under the power of God. 
His critics, even those who believe in faith healing, say it's not the power of God, but the power of suggestion that makes people swoon. The people are worked up into a frenzy. They know what's expected of them, and they do it. I think it is theatrical, and I think it is a gimmick. <laughs> are right words. Witness now how unclean spirits flee when the Reverend Hen approaches. Somebody says, why do you blow on people? I don't know. I just know that the Holy Spirit says do it. And you know what? It works. them. Well, as with Holy Ghost laughter, the question that needs to be asked is, is this a biblical practice? Is there any scriptural support for it? And the faith preachers would say, yes, there is. And they would appeal to a couple of texts in particular, and I would like us to look at these. One of them is Matthew chapter 17. This is when Jesus was being transfigured. And while Jesus yet spake, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were sore afraid. And the faith preachers would say, see, here were the disciples. They were in the presence of God and they fell. Well, yeah, they did. But there's a couple of points I think we need to make here. Number one, in all likelihood, the disciples were not knocked down. They voluntarily lowered themselves down. And... Number two, which direction did the disciples go down? Face forward. Which direction do we see people fall when they're slain in the spirit? Backwards. Hmm. Well, that one won't work. Well, they'll say, what about John chapter 18? This is when Jesus was being arrested. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. He said to them, I am. So when he said to them, I am, that he is not really in the Greek, it's just supplied. They drew back and fell to the ground. And the faith preachers would say, see, here were these men and they were in the presence of God. Not only did they fall, but they even fell backwards. And they did. But let's be intellectually honest here. Who were these people that were doing the falling? Were these believers? No. These were the Roman soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. So this passage can hardly be taken as biblical support for a normative practice for us today. In fact, it's interesting. You can look through the Bible and find a number of examples of people who were in the presence of God and they fell in worship. David did so. Uh, the disciples here in Matthew 17 did so. John did so in Revelation. But without exception, they always fall forwards. They always lower themselves forward. Anytime somebody in Scripture finds themselves in the presence of God and they fall backwards, it's always in judgment. This is not an experience after which I would be seeking. Friends, one of the fundamental problems of the faith movement is that those who teach it and those who follow it interpret the Bible by what they experience rather than interpreting their experiences by the Bible which is how it should be. Friends, no matter how real an experience may seem to us, if that experience does not plumb with God's word, then it's an illegitimate experience. We've exceeded what is written. We've exceeded biblical parameters. And in so doing, we open ourselves up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. I believe the vast majority of people who are slain in the spirit, uh, it's just peer pressure, it's group dynamics, mind over body. That having been said, however, I do believe that at times there are spiritual forces at work, but they are not of God. And I think a lot of these, especially the more extreme examples that was going on in Todd Bentley's meetings and people barking and I mean I saw all kinds of things. I believe a lot of that, the vast majority of it probably, demonic. Now let's look at divine revelation knowledge. 
All of the faith preachers claim that much of what they teach you, they receive directly from divine revelation knowledge, a super special knowledge apart from the scriptures. Now, divine revelation knowledge as the term was first coined by Essek W. Kenyon, the grandfather of this movement. Kenyon believed in two types of knowledge. The first of these is sensory knowledge, that which we get through our five senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, so forth. And the other is revelation knowledge. This is supernatural knowledge that comes only from God. Now, according to Kenyon, the catch here is that these two spheres of knowledge are mutually exclusive. And what that means is, is that reasoning or logical thought is of no value. So in other words, if you really want to go deeper with the Lord, if you really want to go into the deep, secret things of God, you've got to disengage rational thought. Put the old noodle up here in park. Is that what the Bible tells us to do? No. Jesus said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The Bible says we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. So even though Kenyon was the one that first coined the term, the idea itself was not new to Kenyon, far from it. The idea goes back to an ancient heresy known as Gnosticism. The Gnostics derived their name from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the Gnostics also believed in secret divine revelation knowledge through which you could obtain salvation. But to get this knowledge, you had to disengage rational thought, open yourself up to just emotional whims. And, and you see this, it began in Gnosticism, but you see it today in the emergent movement. You see it in the contemplative movement. You see it in the word of faith movement. Same basic error, it just rears itself up, pops up in different places, manifests itself in different ways. Consider this audio clip from Benny Hinn. Adam was a super being when God created him. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether people even know this, but he was the first superman that really ever lived. Okay. First of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, which mm -hmm. means he used to fly. Whoa. Well, of course, how can you have dominion over the birds and not be able to do what they do? Whoa. Actually, I mean, wait a minute. I, wait a minute. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> Danny. I've never heard that. The word have, dominion yes. in the Hebrew clearly declares that if you have dominion over a subject, that you do everything that subject does. In other words, that subject, if it does something you, you cannot do, you don't have dominion over it. I'll prove it further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He used to be, he, 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 he was with one thought, he'd be on the moon. Using Benny Hinn's logic, we might also wonder if Adam was able to shed his skin like a snake, lay an egg like a chicken, or photosynthesize like a magnolia tree. You see how utterly ridiculous this is. However, Benny Hinn's revelation knowledge does get much more serious and much more heretical. This is what he told his church at the time, which was in Orlando, Florida. Benny Hinn said, I want you all to look at me and I want you all to listen carefully to what I'm going to say. This was put to the test by three theologians who read my book because it's in my book. It's not a very easy thing to understand, but let's pray that the Holy Ghost will help all of us. Man, I feel revelation knowledge already coming on me. I want you to lift your hands. Something new is going to happen here today. Holy Spirit, take over in the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, are you here to learn? God the Father, ladies and gentlemen, is a person, and he is a triune being by himself, separate from the Son and the Holy Ghost. What did you say? Hear it. Hear it. God the Father is a person. God the Son is a person. God the Holy Ghost is a person. But each one of them is a triune being by himself. If I can shock you, and maybe I should, there's nine of them. You say, oh, I never heard that. Well, you think you're in this church to hear things you've heard for the last 50 years? So, under divine revelation knowledge, Benny Hinn is teaching a nine-member Godhead. Friends, God will never, under any circumstances, tell us anything that contradicts his word. And a nine-member Godhead contradicts his word. That's heretical. Have you ever stopped to think about how many false religions have begun 
by a single individual coming along the scene and saying, oh, God spoke to me. Let me tell you what he said. Numerous, myriads of false religions. But two big ones come to my mind right off the bat. Mormonism and Islam. It's interesting, both Joseph Smith and Muhammad of Mormonism and Islam respectively, you read the writings of these men. Both of these men were by themselves, completely removed from other people, and this being appeared to them and gave them new revelations. And when you read their writings, both of these men initially struggled with whether this might be a demon. They thought initially it was a demon. And then they became convinced that, no, it was really an angel from God. And so you have two huge false religions that were begun in very, very eerily similar fashions. And I can't prove this. It's just my own working theory. You know, thus saith Justin, not thus saith the Lord. I just, it's my theory that it may have been the same angel, I mean, excuse me, the same demon that appeared to both of these men divine revelation knowledge. Uh, consider this also divine revelation knowledge from Benny Hinn, but this a little bit on the lighter side. Holy Spirit said something to me and I had to go like a madman looking in the Word. He says God's original plan is that the woman was to bring forth children out of her side. Now that's not particularly heretical, I don't suppose, that's just stupid. But Benny Hinn said that the Holy Spirit told him this, that women were supposed to give birth out of their sides. And I learned this just a couple of years ago. That's actually the, the legend of Buddha. According to the legend of Buddha, Buddha's mother gave birth to him out of her side when he was two years old, which I would think would leave just a terrible scar. But at any rate, that's the legend of Buddha. He didn't get that from the Holy Spirit. Consider this text. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. The writer of Hebrews says that God in the Old Testament spoke in a lot of different ways. You know, he spoke to Moses up on the mountain through a storm and thunder. He spoke to Elijah through a still small voice. In Numbers chapter 22, God even made a donkey talk. So God did indeed speak in many different portions and in many different ways. But in these last days, says the writer of Hebrews, God has spoken to us in his Son. Dear friends, Jesus is the final speaking of God. The final speaking of God. Everything that God has to say to us about himself, his character, and his nature, he has said in his Son, Jesus Christ, and we have a perfect, infallible, and errant, all-sufficient record, sufficient record of that in his word. Jesus is the final speaking of God. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I don't want anybody to leave here and think, oh my goodness, Justin told us that God doesn't talk to us anymore. Yes, he does. This is the primary way God speaks to us. And God will speak to us through the convicting power of His Holy Spirit, through His Word, to convict us of sin, to convict us of, of righteousness and judgment. God will give us wisdom. But God always speaks through His Word, friends. And God is not revealing anything new about Himself, His character and His nature that is not already revealed in His Word. One of my favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in what? In his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? What more can God say to us, dear friends, than what he has already said in his word? Sadly, some of the faith preachers even delve into the realm of the occult and the demonic. The Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, 
giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Listen to the following audio clip of Kenneth Copeland. Suddenly, I began to be aware that my body, that my spirit, is coming out of my body. And, I, and it, it scared me, and, and I, man, I, I grabbed hold of it with my will and wouldn't let it go. He said, the day you were down there in such and such town, standing over there behind that curtain, and your spirit started coming out of your body, and you jerked back like that and thought you was dying, and you let fear get hold of you, and I remember I did. I said, well, God, I mean... <laughs> Really? Now, is this what kind of a horse do you think I am? That they're not going to, you know, at least give you a few chills to stand there and die. He said, you weren't dying. I said, what do you mean I wasn't dying? My spirit was coming out of my body. He said, that's right. You were fixing. He said, you were just about to come out of your body, and I was going to allow you to minister to that congregation without your body. You were going to go through that congregation like a whirlwind of the power and the glory of God. I said, you let's show me that in the scripture. He said, and he showed me 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. He said, you missed that opportunity for that experience. I said, what was I going to do? He said, I'm not going to tell you. You missed it. I said, can I have a second chance? <laughs> now, aside from just absolutely giving you the willies about a disembodied Kenneth Copeland moving through the congregation, friends, I don't want a disembodied anybody moving through me, much less Kenneth Copeland. But friends, that is foreign to the Word of God. And no, Mr. Copeland, it's not in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's not there. If anything, that is demonic. Benny Hinn readily admits that his model in ministry is the late Catherine Kuhlman. Some of you may remember Catherine Kuhlman. She was a faith healer, died in the mid-70s. Though Benny Hinn never met her personally, uh, he was a great admirer of hers and studied her and uh, just a brief clip to remind you of who Catherine Kuhlman was. And everything that you and I receive must come through Jesus. Ken says he is a disciple of the late Catherine Kuhlman, a famous spiritual healer in the early days of television. The power of God is going through this man. That's power. If you look at his performance, his shtick, and you look at Catherine Kuhlman, they're the same person. Praise the Lord, will you? Except he's got a white suit and she's got a white dress. I mean, he's aped all of Catherine Kuhlman's mannerisms. Pick them up high. Pick them up high. Pick up your legs, up and down. Up, up, up. So fond of Catherine Kuhlman is Benny Hinn that not even the grave has kept her from visiting him. Necromancy is defined as the special mode of obtaining aid or knowledge by the conjuration of the dead. And Benny Hinn, on several occasions, readily admits that Catherine Kuhlman has been appearing to him, visiting him, to give him instruction and direction in his ministry. What does the Bible have to say about this? Well, the one guilty of necromancy is detestable before the Lord and even subject to the death penalty. This is not a sin which God takes lightly. Dear friends, we should not be talking to dead people. The Bible explicitly condemns this. And yet Benny Hinn, and he's not alone, by the way, Jesse Duplantis also, they readily admit to talking to dead people. And uh, I heard Jesse Duplantis in person encourage all those who are in attendance to get in touch with their dead, dead loved ones, to get wisdom and get comfort from their dead loved ones. Astonishing to me that these people who claim to be some of our leaders readily admit to engaging in activity that's explicitly condemned by the scriptures. Our final section in this session is entitled False Prophets. How can you tell a false prophet? Well, the following list is not exhaustive, but it does hit just a couple of the high points. 
Number one, if a man or a woman worships or prophesies in the name of any God other than Yahweh, then he or she is a false prophet. Now, the faith preachers do not do this explicitly in the sense they don't prophesy in the name of Baal or something like that. But we've already seen how Benny Hinn gets spiritual direction uh, from witches, and we've seen how the faith preachers teach a different Jesus, and if they teach a different Jesus, they meet this criterion. Another is if a man or woman habitually displays questionable moral character, then he or she cannot speak for God. I could have an entire seminar, literally, an entire seminar devoted to just the lies that Benny Hinn has told about major events in his own life and ministry. Just on that. He really has a problem with the truth, to put it charitably. Uh, has questionable moral character and knowingly claims people to be healed that he knows are not healed. He has a problem with character and integrity. One of the easiest ways to tell a false prophet is if a prophet offers prophecies that just do not come true. Now this might sound deceptively uh, easy to ascertain, but sometimes when these prophets will offer a prophecy, they won't put a time frame on it. And so when it never seems to happen, they'll say, oh, I just meant that for you know, years down the road. I didn't mean that for any time here. Uh, but sometimes they do give us time frames for their prophecies and make it a lot easier. I want to look at one prophecy that I discovered from Kenneth Copeland just about a year ago. He offered this at the end of 1994, the beginning of 1995. In those couple of months there, this is what Kenneth Copeland prophesied. He wrote it in his magazine, Believer's Voice of Victory. He said, and we're going to see the move of God like we've never seen it before because you mark my word, 1995 is the beginning of the beyond what we are able to ask or think. Every year has a name. 1995 is that beginning. It has come. There are many Muslims that while they are trying to worship what they think is God, Jesus is going to appear right in the middle of it. And under the influence of the power of the Holy Ghost, Islam will fall. Islam will become nothing. Well, we all know how that prophecy turned out now, don't we? And I'll give you three guesses, and two of them don't count, as to what is the fastest growing religion in the United States of America. And it ain't Christianity. Islam. The following audio clip was recorded on December the 31st, 1989, at Benny Hinn's church, which at the time was in Orlando, Florida. You can listen to this audio tape, which I have of Benny Hinn. And on, in this New Year's Eve service, December the 31st, 1989, Benny Hinn goes into a trance. And in this trance, he begins to offer prophecies that were supposed to come true in the 1990s, in the upcoming decade of the 1990s. And you can hear Benny Hinn on this tape, and after he rattles off a number of these prophecies, then he kind of snaps out of it, and he, he, he kind of comes to his senses. He says, whew, whew, I have no idea what I just said. No idea. Did, did you tape that? Did, did you tape that, brother? Well, unfortunately for him, someone did. And so let's listen to these prophecies and see how many of them he got right. The Spirit of God tells me an earthquake will hit the east coast of America and destroy much in the 90s. Not one place will be safe from earthquakes in the 90s. These who have not known earthquakes will know it. People, I feel the Spirit all over me. The economy of the United States of America is going to fall. Many businesses will go bankrupt. The Spirit tells me Fidel Castro will die in the 90s. Oh my. The Spirit tells me that the church, once raptured, Following the rapture, a woman president will be in the White House. And that woman president will destroy this nation. But 
that my church will, will be gone. My saints will be home. A world dictator is coming on the scene. My. He's a short man. He's a short man. I see a short man who's the perfect incarnation of Satan. The Lord also tells me to tell you in the mid-90s, about 94, 95, no later than that, God will destroy the homosexual community of America. But he will not destroy it with what many minds have thought him to be. He will destroy it with fire. And many will turn and be saved, and many will rebel and be destroyed. One, two, three, four, five, six strikes, you're out. This is by no means exhaustive of Benny Hinn's false prophecies. This is just all he managed on one particular night. Friends, you can look at every biblical criterion as to how to discern a false prophet. And these individuals meet each and every one of them. At some point, one must call a spade a spade. I take no joy in this. I wish this seminar was not even necessary. But uh, unfortunately, it is. But again, my desire is that this seminar will help equip you to do what Ephesians 4.15 tells us to do, and that is to speak the truth in love, lovingly and gently, yet with biblical conviction, guide people away from a different gospel.